Minds of mine, the fanatic Melanie's mind so great you can't have it Melanie's mind, the mind of fanatic Melanie's mind's the great you can't have it Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I know I haven't posted in a while, but it's been so hard to find the motivation during this quarantine lockdown, but I finally found a true crime story that I think will really, really interest you guys. And so today I'm going to be talking about the Gainesville Ripper. So this killing spree would actually inspire the 1996 horror classic Scream. So if you've seen the movie Scream, this murder spree that I'm about to talk about is what inspired this movie. So if that's something that interests you, keep watching. And right here I just want to drop a disclaimer really quick that this story is incredibly gruesome and I do go in depth a little bit about the deaths of some of the victims and if that's something that makes you uncomfortable or something that you don't want to listen to, I would just suggest that you don't watch this video. You can go ahead and watch one of my previous true crime videos that are definitely not as gruesome as this one, but this one is just going to be really gruesome. I just wanted to let you guys know. So before I go into all of my research and everything that I'm going to talk today about, I just want to go ahead and cite my sources. A lot of the details that I found about this case, I found on Wikipedia. I listened to the My Favorite Murder podcast episode 133, where Georgia Hardstark actually talks about this. I also read an article on All Things Interesting, and I also watched the video that Eleanor Neal did on the Gainesville Ripper and I'll link all of my sources down below just in case you guys want to check any of them out because I would highly recommend you did that. Eleanor's video was amazing and also my favorite murder is always one of my favorites so I would definitely recommend going out and listening to that podcast too. So before I go into the childhood and the upbringing of the person nicknamed the Gainesville Ripper, I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit of what this person did. So the Gainesville Ripper is responsible for murdering and terrorizing five college students in Gainesville, Florida and he murdered them in the most twisted ways possible. Four of the victims were female and one of the victims were male and three of those victims he brutally raped also and he mutilated two of the victims. So the Gainesville Ripper's real name was Danny Rowling and Danny Rowling was born May 1954 in Shreveport, Louisiana. His father James Rowling never actually wanted kids and because of this he would abuse Danny and his mother. The first time that his dad actually abused him was when he was one years old because James was mad that Danny wasn't crawling properly. And when Kevin, Danny's brother, was born, it only made the abuse get much worse. Danny actually failed the third grade because he missed class so much for illnesses, and I'm not sure what illness he had, but he had been missing school because he was sick all the time. Teachers described Danny as having aggressive tendencies and not being able to control himself. So by 11 years old, Danny actually picked up music and he sang songs and he liked to play the guitar a little bit but also at this time he picked up drugs and alcohol and as this was all happening his mom actually got committed into a mental institute for slitting her wrists and she swore that James Rowling, Danny's father, had actually made her slit her wrists. By 14 years old, Danny's neighbor had caught Danny peeping in through his daughter's window and told Danny's dad and because of this, James beat the living shit out of Danny. Shortly after this, Danny tried to get into the military and he bounced around a little bit trying to figure out where he wanted to be, if he wanted to be in the Navy or in the Air Force, but he realized that he didn't find any comfort in the military and he thought he was gonna find some sort of comfort. So he actually left and a lot of it had to do with the amount of drugs he was using. He had actually taken acid over a hundred times and that can't possibly be good for your brain or healthy for you. Once he left the military, he actually got out and got married and it seemed like he was having a pretty normal life. But at 23 years old in 1977, just four years after being married, his wife divorced him because he had threatened to kill her. After his divorce was finalized, he used that anger and sadness that he felt after his divorce and he actually raped a woman that resembled his ex-wife. And that same year, he actually struck and killed a woman with his car. I couldn't find if he served any jail time for these two things, but I really don't think that he did. So from 1970 to 1990, Danny Rollins was actually committing 
a lot of petty theft and a lot of petty crime. That whole time from 1970 to 1990, he was in and out of jail. During this time in Shreveport, Louisiana, where Danny Rollings was born and raised, 24-year-old Julie Grissom, her father Sean, and her nephew Tom, who was eight years old, were found in their home killed around the same time that Danny had lost his last job. The police didn't tie Danny Rollings into this murder. They thought that it was just a robbery gone wrong or something. So he felt like he had gone away with this triple homicide. Also in May 1990, three months before the Gainesville Ripper murder spree, Danny Rollings had actually tried to kill his own father. He shot his 58-year-old dad twice, but his father survived and he got out of this accident missing an eye and an ear. But the thing is, Danny didn't know that his father had survived. Danny thought that he'd killed his father. So right after this happened, he fled. He changed his identity with papers he stole and he fled to Florida in July of 1990. And this is where the horror takes place. Once he arrived to Florida, it was only a short amount of time before this horrific murder spree happened. So this whole thing starts off in August. It's the beginning of the school semester at Florida State, which is in Gainesville, Florida. Gainesville is a college town, and at this time, 36,000 students were coming in to move into campus. So on August 20th, the Sunday before class began. It was 4 p.m. and a police officer was called to the Williamsburg Village apartment complex because of a noise complaint. When the police arrived, the building maintenance man was there and he was there with the parents of whoever was in the apartment where the noise complaint came. The residents of that apartment were 17-year-old Christina Powell and 17-year-old Sonia Larson. Christina Powell's parents were supposed to come to the dorm anyway, but they hadn't heard from their daughter, so they got really worried, especially because she wasn't answering any of her calls. And on top of that, her roommate, Sonia Larson, was also not answering any of the calls from her parents. So with the police and the building maintenance man there, they went to the door and they tried to unlock it, but they couldn't, so they broke in. As soon as they enter the apartment, they find the bloody naked body of Sonia Larson on her bed, and then downstairs, Christina Powell's body is in the same condition. They had both been stabbed to death. So I'm gonna take this back to August 23rd. And on August 23rd, Christina and Sonia had actually gone to Walmart to go pick up some decorations for their dorm, and then they had gone straight home. They did their thing and then they fell asleep. And while Christina and Sonia slept, Danny Rollings, the Gainesville Ripper, broke in. He found Christina on the couch, he stood over her, looked at her, and then decided to go upstairs. And that's where he found Sonia asleep in her bed. He murdered Sonia by taping her mouth shut and then stabbing her to death. She had stab wounds all over her hands, all over her arms, because she died fighting him off. And once he killed Sonia, he dragged her body to the edge of the bed and he posed her in a sexually demeaning way so that whoever found her was shocked with what they would see. He wanted police or he wanted whoever found her to be shocked and to not be able to get that image out of their head. So then after Danny Rollings was done killing Sonia, he went downstairs to go kill Christina. But he actually spent a lot more time with Christina. He taped her mouth and her hands so that she could not fight and he raped her repeatedly stabbed her until she died, and displayed her body in the same sexually demeaning way that he had done to Sonia. And while Christina was dead, he took the opportunity to cut off her nipples and he took them with him. When police came into this crime scene, they were completely shocked. Reporters recall knowing that something was completely wrong when they witnessed trained officers, people that have been on the force for many, many years who have seen many things, running out of the apartment and throwing up. That's just how gruesome the crime scene was. When police came in and examined the bodies of the girls, there was actually a towel next to Christina's body because her body had been washed. And they theorized that whoever had killed her had washed her to get rid of any evidence that he could have possibly left on her, which is exactly what Danny Rollins was trying to do. Police determined that the girls were most likely killed on Friday night the same night that they had gone out to Walmart and came back home. They didn't find them until Sunday. The news of this quickly spread on campus and everyone was freaking out. Everyone was scared because students had just came in to start their first semester and to make matters worse, before they even finished packing up this first crime scene, detectives are called to a second crime scene. 18 year old Krista Hoyt didn't show up to work and was not answering her phone, which was really unlike her. And the news of two girls being murdered was already going around the whole city. So Krista's co-workers panicked and they called the police. At 12.30 a.m., two officers came to her apartment to check on her and that's when they were met with the building manager. They went to go check out Krista Hoyt's apartment 
and the first thing that the building manager noticed was that her back gate was on the ground and that was really odd. The back door was locked but the currents to the back door didn't reach the ground all the way. So police had a very 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 small space at the bottom where they could kind of peek their head in to see if they could see anything. So that's what they did. They got on the ground and tried to peek through the little, little tiny space through the curtain. And that's when they saw the body of a naked woman slouched at the edge of the bed. And the more they looked, they realized that this body had no head. From outside, they can hear water running inside the apartment. So they wait for backup before they go in. Once they go inside, they found water dripping in the shower, but no one there. And that's when they saw Krista Hoyt's head placed on a bookshelf facing her lifeless body. Krista died from a single stab wound to the back. Police saw her wounds and noticed that it was the same knife used on Sonia and Christina. So police started to tie in together that they were looking for a serial killer. And they knew they were looking for the same guy because Krista's nipples were also cut off of her but placed on the side of the bed next to her. The next day, on Tuesday, August 27th, two more victims are found slain in their apartment. It was 23-year-old Manny Travota and 23-year-old Tracy Polis. So Manny and Tracy were actually seniors and they had been best friends since high school and they decided to live together and be roommates and Tracy's parents were really okay with this because Manny was six foot three and he was over 200 pounds. They felt like Tracy was safe around him, like they didn't have anything to worry about if she was around him. So on that Tuesday, a friend of Manny and Tracy's actually told one of their other friends to go check on them because they hadn't heard from them all weekend. So the friend goes to their apartment and gets the maintenance man, and the friend and the maintenance man go to Tracy and Manny's apartment, and the maintenance man opens the door and the first thing that they see when they open the door is Tracy's lifeless body on the ground, naked and bloody. The maintenance man closed the door right away and locked it because he didn't want to contaminate the scene and he went to go call the police right away. Police arrived really fast. They arrived no later than five minutes. And when they come to the door, the door is unlocked from the inside. And the most bizarre thing is that the maintenance man swore that when he opened the door and saw Tracy's body, he saw a black bag next to Tracy's body. But when the police came in, the black bag was gone. So police theorize that maybe when the maintenance man and the friend came in, Danny Rollings, the Gainesville Ripper, was still in the apartment and because they closed the door right away and left, it gave him the opportunity to leave and he was able to grab his bag and leave. And that is also why police think that there was no mutilations because they think that Danny Rollings would have, but he just didn't have the time because he was interrupted. Tracy's body was found laying in the hallway. She had been bound and she had been raped. Her cause of death were three stab wounds to the back. And there was evidence that she was killed in her room, but dragged into the hallway where she was also posed in a sexually demeaning way. Manny's body was found stabbed to death in his room, but you could tell that he put up a fight. There was a vicious struggle. So with all this happening in Gainesville, news was spreading like wildfire. In this small town, there were a whole bunch of news reporters, a whole bunch of news vans. And you can kind of see that they did take some of those aspects into the Scream movie. Because it's a small town that was completely bombarded with news vans and newscasters because something crazy was happening in a place that things didn't really happen. While the fear of the Gainesville Ripper is at an all-time high, students at Florida State are actually coming together. And there was up to 12 to 20 students in one apartment a night just spending the night together because they felt safer that way. Students were told that they would not be penalized if they didn't show up to class and that it was fine if they decided to go home. A lot of students actually decided to drop out of Florida State and apply somewhere else because they just didn't want to go there anymore. The craziest thing to me is that in Gainesville and all the shops in the cities around Gainesville, they all sold out of guns, mace, baseball bats, and pretty much all the things that you could think of to protect yourself. Everyone was gearing up because they were scared. They didn't know who the Gainesville Ripper was targeting. Everyone thought that he was targeting petite brown haired college students, but then he killed this six foot three, 200 pound man, so no one felt safe. The crappy thing about this whole case is that once everything happened, police didn't have very many leads. They knew that all of the victims' homes had sliding glass doors, and that's how the Gainesville Ripper gained access into their home. They also knew that all the victims had apartments that faced into 
the forest, like a foresty area. So they knew the Gainesville Ripper would stalk his victims before he would attack them, and he would hide outside at night and watch his victims through the window. So police actually had one main suspect, and this main suspect was 18-year-old Edward Humphrey. And Edward Humphrey lived in the same apartment complex that Tracy and Manny lived in. But the thing is, he had gotten kicked out for erratic behavior toward other tenants of the apartment. He was also known to carry a knife at all times, so this really rose a lot of red flags on police's radar. So on August 30th, three days after the last murder, Edward Humphrey was arrested for aggravated assault against his grandmother. And because of this, he was sent into a mental institute. And once he was sent to this mental institute, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And because Edward Humphrey assaulted his grandmother, police had a reason to believe that Edward Humphrey was a violent person and could have possibly committed these violent crimes. So the police thought that they had their killer and even the people of Gainesville thought that they had their killer because once Edward Humphrey was in custody, the murder stopped and that even validated their argument even more. So on October 10th, Edward Humphrey was sentenced to 22 months in a mental institute and police had taken DNA from Edward Humphrey and while he was in this mental institute, the DNA results came back and it showed that Edward Humphrey was not the Gainesville Ripper. Even though the police wanted it to be, it just wasn't. So they had to go back to square one and go back and look at all of their leads again. So what the Gainesville police decided to do is that they called all counties and requested any information they had on similar crimes. And one of the places that got back to them was actually Shreveport, Louisiana, where you guessed it, Danny Rollins was from. And that's where the triple homicide of Julie, Sean, and Tom came into light. It happened in November of 1989, but the crime scenes were so similar to that of the Gainesville Ripper. Julie had actually been mutilated and raped and displayed in a sexually demeaning manner, just like all of the victims of the Gainesville Ripper. So because of this information, Gainesville police decided to go ahead and look back at any crime that happened during the Gainesville Ripper murder spree. And this included looking at bank robberies. So actually, on August 27th, 1990, the same day that they found Krista Hoyt's body, there had actually been a bank robbery in Gainesville. The two suspects were a black man and a white man. And later that day, a black man and a white man were seen very, very close to the forest and a police officer actually came by to question them. And when he came by, the white male ran into the woods and started making a run for it. And the black male didn't do anything. He kind of just realized that he had gone caught and didn't care, but the white male ran. And police had tried to run after him, but they lost him. All they had found when they went to go look for him was a hobo camp. And this hobo camp was very, very close to the houses of the victims. And at this campsite, they actually found a bunch of dyed money. They knew that it was the person from the bank robbery. And so they decided to pack up the whole campsite and put it in an evidence locker. So police saw this, and with that in mind, they pulled out the bin that had the hobo camp out of storage and sent it out to get tested. So while this whole thing is happening, Gainesville police receive a call from another police department in Florida, and they said that they arrested a man for armed robbery, and that this man was originally from Shreveport, Louisiana. So the police did a background check on this man that they found, and they realized that this man was actually wanted for the attempted murder of his father in Shreveport, Louisiana. This man was Danny Rowling. So with everything that police knew, Danny Rowling was starting to look like a very possible suspect. And so police asked for his DNA, and he actually gave it to them. And police told Danny that they actually needed some of his pubic hair to test for DNA. And Danny stood up, exposed himself to them, and then yanked two handfuls of his pubes out and put them on the table and said that should be enough. So police got the results back from the hobo site and they found Danny Rowling's DNA. They found traces of the victim's blood. They found the screwdriver that he would use to pry open the sliding glass doors. So police get all the stuff back from the hobo site and they test Danny Rowling's DNA to the stuff they found at the campsite and to the stuff that they found at the murder sites. And Danny Rowling was a DNA match. They had finally found the Gainesville Ripper. Danny Rowling's was finally known to the public 
for what he truly was, a savage murderer. He was sentenced to five counts of first degree murder, three counts of sexual battery, and three counts of armed burglary. So while Danny Rollings was in jail, he actually befriended his cellmate, and his cellmate was a man named Bobby Lewis. And Danny Rollings told Bobby Lewis all about his crimes and about how he wanted to be a star like Ted Bundy. And so one month before his trial, Danny Rollings told police that he was ready to confess, but he had one condition, and his condition was that he did not want to speak to police directly. What he wanted to do was speak through Bobby Lewis. So what he did was answer police's questions, but he would whisper it into Bobby Lewis's ear, and then Bobby Lewis would tell it to the police. And it took a very long time, but police had finally gotten Danny Rollings' confession. Danny told police that he traveled to all of the murder sites by bike because it would bring a lot less attention. He also told police that the same night that Sonia and Christina were at Walmart, he had been at that Walmart too and he had actually spotted them and thought that they were really cute brunettes and so he decided to stalk them and he stalked them all the way home and from there he broke in from the sliding door and you already know what he did next. And then for Krista Hoy and Tracy Polis, he had done the same thing he targeted them and he stalked them right before he killed them. And Danny Rollings actually refused to talk about the Louisiana triple homicide. He said that he would talk about it in the future on his own time. So in April 1994, the trial began and Danny Rowling's defense was ready to plead not guilty by reason of insanity, but to take some bit of control back to his life, I guess, or for some reason. As soon as the trial started, Danny Rowling stood up and pled guilty without talking to his defense lawyers or anything beforehand, maybe just for some more shock value, he stood up and pled guilty for five counts of murder. And because of him doing this, he was sentenced to death. And on October 25th, 2006, 12 years after all this happened, Danny Rollings was executed. Many of the victims' families actually got to watch this happen, and they watched Danny Rollings die from lethal injection. He died at 6.31 p.m. and after his death, police found a note in his cell where he confessed to killing the Grissom family. And that is the story of the Gainesville Ripper. I honestly can't believe this story. It's so wild to honestly think about the stuff that happens in the real world. It's completely terrifying and fascinating to me learning what has inspired these horror movies because a lot of them are inspired by real events, by real monsters, by real serial killers. And I was pretty blown away when I realized that Scream, the movie, this movie that, you know, I've seen many a times throughout my life, was actually inspired by something real, something that really happened. And I just hope that you guys are having a really, really good time in this quarantine. Well, as much as a good time as it allows under the circumstances. I know it can get really boring and I've been feeling incredibly unmotivated, but hopefully it'll be all over soon. But if you liked this video, I would appreciate it if you gave me a thumbs up and if you let me know what you thought about this video because I found it really, really interesting. And if you guys want me to do maybe another video on, you know, like what inspired another horror movie because I think that that's so interesting to learn about. But anyways, that's all for me. I really love you guys and appreciate all you guys. Thank you for everyone who stayed until the very end. Until next time.